want you to think back to grade school. Your teacher gives you a little styrofoam cup. You put some dirt in it and some seeds, put some water on it, and you leave it for a number of days. And the sprout comes up. And it begins to grow and eventually turns into a plant. And I remember this project when I was that age, and how exciting it was to see life come from a tiny little seed. And our lesson for today talks in this type of imagery. In fact, I want to read to you the first part of our text for today. And it comes to us from Mark chapter 4, verse 26. Jesus said, The kingdom of God, as if a man should scatter seed in the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces it by itself, first a blade, then the ear, then the full grain of ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts the sickle because the harvest has come. Now back in the days of Jesus, when he walked on the planet, a lot of people were farmers. And this type of imagery made a lot of sense to them. And this is the only of the Gospels that has this particular aspect of this parable. And we see some other agrarian types of parables, but this one basically is saying that the farmer goes and he puts the seed in the ground and just waits and watches and it begins to grow and he really doesn't have a whole lot to do with it other than he puts the seed in the ground and, and the plant, the crops come to life and eventually when the crops are ripe, they're harvested. And I think back to my grandfather on a farm up in northern Minnesota and he had grain and potatoes and barley and it was always fun to go up there in the fall to see the, the harvest, to see all the activity that took place. And, and so it is with you know, farmers. They, they plant the seed and they, they do what they can to take care of it, but really a lot of what happens is out of their control. If there's you know, flooding, if there's dry weather, or if there's a windstorm that comes through, or a tornado, but yet they're able to make a living from what they do. And the point being here, there is work that God calls us to do. And as I stand under this huge tree right now providing shade, it goes back to the whole concept of seed, that this tree at one point was a small seed and it grew and then it became very large. We have a seed to plant that goes way beyond anything that this earth can accomplish as far as planting worldly seed. Because trees, even this one here, one day will die. Crops, they, they go through their season and they're harvested. But yet what I want to talk about today is a seed that has eternal significance. And that's the seed of God's word. And that's what we are called upon to share and to plant in this world, in the lives of others, through what we say and through what we do. And what happens with that seed after it's planted is it's kind of beyond our control. It's up to the Holy Spirit. We see the parable, for example, of the sower who, who sows a seed and some goes on a hard path and, and nothing happens. And some goes in a rocky soil, it begins to grow and it withers and it dies. And if some goes amongst the thorns and thistles, it begins to grow, but then, then the thorns and thistles of life choke out that plant. And it doesn't really grow to fruition. And some grow, falls on good soil 30, 60, and 100 fold. We can't explain how it works. But we share the word of God and some people receive it, some people don't. Some people receive it for a while, then they kind of reject it and turn away from it. But our job is simple, to sow the seed of God's word. And with that too, there's a second part of this parable which is rather interesting. It says this, And he said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It's like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Now this one is an interesting parable. It talks about a seed that turns into what's called a mustard plant. And to be honest with you, in that day and age, the mustard plant was almost like a weed. And so imagine a farmer, he has a field of grain. And all of a sudden, a mustard seed <laughs> takes root. If that mustard plant is not dealt with, it's going to seed more, and it's going to produce even more mustard plants, and it could take over the grain field. And so when Jesus shared this parable for those of the farmers, they're thinking, they're probably grimacing and groaning. It's like, why a mustard plant? 
And when you think about it, you think about how Jesus began the kingdom of God as far as what the work he did on this planet. That he came and he trained 12 disciples. And the church at that time, even the government at that time, they turned against Jesus. They wanted to wipe him out. They felt he was like a weed. And yet, the more they tried to wipe him out, in fact, they killed him, they killed most of his disciples at a, you know, fairly early in their ministries for most of them, but yet, the kingdom of God kept growing and kept spreading. Not really like a weed, it's something that is something very important, something more important than anything in this life. But yet the world may look at it as a weed. In fact, Christianity has grown and thrived for centuries being the most persecuted religion in the world. And the more it's persecuted, the more it seems to keep growing and, and spreading. We see this so often even in, in countries with great persecution. For example, even in Russia, when the Iron Curtain came down, it was realized there were many Christians in Russia, even through all the persecution they went through. Even in China, with all the persecution against Christianity, the Christian population continues to grow in underground churches. And the point is this, that the kingdom of God started small with Jesus and his disciples, and even though the world tried to trample him out, it's grown and spread to be the largest religion in the world today with over two billion followers and growing. But it starts small and it grows. And so what is the point for us in our lives? You know, for me, the more I've gone through ministry, I realize that smallness leads to bigness. I've done a lot of study in how Jesus discipled his 12. And I realized he started with a small group and it was all about quality, not about quantity. It was quality, making disciples, making people and followers who not only believed in him, but were willing to go that extra mile to spread the gospel, even willing to sacrifice and, and even put their own lives in risk. And so it is, what I'm seeing more and more in ministry too, is that what this world needs is not just believers. Believers, it's important. If you believe in Jesus, you're forgiven, you're gonna live forever, but what Jesus commissioned and the vision he has is a world filled with disciples people that are fully bought into the word of god and live it out with their lives and show what love looks like in a world filled with sin and so what i'm seeing more and more in my life and even in the situation i'm in right now and through coaching and through working in a smaller church that through quality relationships things grow even more for example in my coaching one example a situation of a pastor I'm working with in Michigan. He reached out to me about three years ago. And about 20 years ago, I worked with him in Michigan and this church was inner city of Detroit, struggling, really having a difficult time. But I was able to work with him and, and the church began to stabilize and get stronger. And, and it went another 20 years. And he reached out to me and he said, you know, we're struggling again. And I began to encourage him with outreach and, and planting more seeds in the community. But then he had cancer. And cancer hit him hard. He's still, even three years later, still recovering from cancer and, and still going through treatments. But yet, during the last three years, his church has almost quadrupled in size. In a matter of two months, they had 25 baptisms of inner-city African-American children, just beautiful children. There's a, a link in the description where you can watch the video of those, some of those baptisms. And this church has really taken off. How? I was able to work with him and help him to find other people to work alongside of him to plant even more seeds and to serve the community. And it's amazing what happens as the word of God spreads, as that seed gets into more people's lives and as people go out with the message. Here's a challenge in the world today. For most Christians, they feel you go to church, that church is something you do inside of a building. You know, Jesus never said, go, to church and make disciples. I mean, it can be done there. He says, go to the world and make disciples. You know, don't turn inward, turn outward. And that's what I see that when churches turn inward, they begin to implode upon themselves. When they turn outward, amazing things happen. When they take the word of God out to the community and spread that seed and, and it may start small, but it's amazing how it can grow and become larger. The church I'm at right now, Holy Cross Lutheran, is actually the smallest church I've ever served at. I've served for most of my ministry in very large churches, and I had this thing in my mind that, that things have to be large, but, but one thing I forgot is that for things to get large, they must first be smaller. 
and so often even in larger settings, it's, it's hard to really get to know all the people. You can, it's impossible. And sometimes the quality relationships can be challenging as well. And what I've learned from this congregation I'm serving right now is, is that through relationships and as the relationships are closer and we're encouraging one another and there's a deeper fellowship, I'm seeing things growing in, in a different way, in, in depth. And what I see for the future of this church is it's going to keep growing, but it's going to be small insofar as it's going to always be close with one another. There's always going to be these deep relationships, and that's one thing I want to see go all the way through. But things so often, and when it comes to God's kingdom, it starts small, and then it grows larger. And, and with this too, as far as a takeaway from the sermon, the little things in life matter. The small things are important. The conversation may take place at a gas station at the person across the pump, on the other side of the pump that you're pumping the gas from. Or it might be with a cashier at the store, or a waitress or a waiter at a restaurant, or a neighbor that's struggling. So often the little things become big things. Little things that turn people in the right direction towards God. I shared before about my mom putting a book called Evidence Demands a Verdict on my bed when I was in high school. And I read that book, and through that book, it began me on a journey that ultimately really changed my life forever as I came to know who Jesus is and came to faith in him. Little things are important. So often we look at things, we want things big. We want to see you know, the exciting things all around us so often come in bigness. No. So often the best things are the small things, the little things, the words of love, the actions that, that may seem small but yet turn into amazing things. And so, when it comes to this parable, when it comes to the kingdom of God, so often it begins small. And then from there, it grows. And so often we may think, you know, I'm insignificant. I can't make a difference. I tell you what, the next conversation you have at a store or restaurant, the next act of kindness you show to someone, could begin a chain reaction to maybe the next Billy Graham type of person coming in the picture. Small things lead to big things, and so it is in the kingdom of God. The things we do, no matter how small, can have huge impact. Just like this tree here was a tiny seed at one point, and it's grown to this huge tree. And so it is. Smallness leads to largeness in the kingdom of God. Quality relationships, even small relationships as far as numbers of people, can lead to explosion reaching thousands or even millions of people. And so it is in the kingdom of God. That so often, great things come in very small packages. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you show us an example of relationship. You didn't start the kingdom big. You sm focused on a small group of people that you trained and you discipled. And they went out and changed the world and it began small and it grew large. And so in our lives, Lord, the small things can lead to big things. No matter how insignificant, everything we do, that we say, that we act upon in your name can lead to things that have eternal significance and ultimately impact the lives of people even go beyond what we can possibly imagine because your word is powerful and your spirit works through your word. The small things so often lead to amazingly big things that great things can come in small packages. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.